This game was played in the second round of a closed international tournament in Budapest in September of 97. There is a series of events like this organized by Laszlo Nagy called the First Saturday Internationals. Every other month he organizes a GM event, and this was the second I've played. For some reason, I absolutely love to play in the Hungarian Chess Federation building, which lies just off Kossuth Square and the Parliament building and a few blocks away from the Danube River. There's a haunting sense of chess history in the club, ancient photographs of great players, no color, few smiles, all black, white, and gray. It's dank, a little depressing, away from all the glitz of America. The ancient Hungarian grandmasters wander around chewing tobacco. The walls are not friendly. People don't really smile. But there is no pretense, just a love of chess. Some would say the wasteland of communism. I would nod, smile, and see the Buddha hills rising beyond the chain bridge, over the Danube, and recall my evenings walking the streets, digging the people, writing in my little notebook, breathing in this beautiful city of grey. My opponent in this game was Israeli international master Afek. Along with being a very strong player, Afek is a famous chess composer. He creates beautiful and virtually unfathomable positions, and then publishes them or asks great players to try to find the solution. It isn't uncommon to see him sitting at a table surrounded by GMs and IMs and other chess lovers, all studying a chess board, some pulling out their hair in concentration, others smiling because they've given up or just love watching confusion set in on great minds. Someone will yelp, break the silence with a solution that Affect quickly refutes. Silence returns. Heads shake. Eventually, after all have decided that there can, in fact, be no answer to the question he's asked, he quietly shows a simple sequence that no one had seen. I watched a beautiful scene later in the tournament in which Afek and Grandmaster Pal Benko sat down at a chessboard. Benko is a friend and former teacher of mine who's a chess legend from the Bobby Fischer days. He's regarded as the greatest endgame composer in the world, and to watch the two of them revealing old masterpieces was like listening to Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie drive each other to further heights of brilliance. Okay, my opponent played e4, c5, the Sicilian defense, knight f3, d6, d4. Now in this position, the immediate move that black always plays is he takes d4. I slightly changed my move order, playing knight f6 first. White's best move is to respond with knight c3, and then I played c takes d4. Knight takes d4. The reason I did this, in fact, is because my opponent, if we go back to the position after knight f3, d6, d4, after c takes d4, sometimes with white, he plays queen takes d4, and then tries to play a plan with the white pawn from c2 moving to c4, a system which he likes to play with white. So what I did is slightly adjust my move order in the Sicilian so that he wouldn't have the option to go into part of his repertoire. Knight f6, knight c3, c takes d4, knight takes d4. Notice now that if he were to take with the queen, he wouldn't be able to play the Marazzi system with the pawn on c4. So knight takes d4, I played knight c6, and he played bishop c4. This is called the Sozin variation against my classical Sicilian. I play queen b6, a variation I've played for many years. Now here the main line is knight b3. White retreats his knight to a normal square, and the game progresses along the lines of what would be called the Shinvinigan Sicilian, which is the which many of the games from the Kasparov and Nand World Championship match were played in. My opponent here decided to play a more modern idea. Knight takes c6, b takes c6, and he castled. This particular variation was not considered to be terribly dangerous for black in the past, but since then, some very strong grandmasters have, have found some good ideas for white in it, and black has to play very accurately. I played g6, a system which I've worked out. I think it's quite good. And my opponent played queen e2. So from this moment, I want you to notice that white has slightly more central space than black. I can't immediately attack. There's nothing for me to attack. You see his king is very safe, and though I am an aggressive player, you might think I have the desire to attack. We have to play in chess what the position gives to us. After queen e2, my opponent has a threat, e5. How would you handle the position? The most natural response, since I've just played g6, is to continue with bishop g7. But this would be a slight mistake. After bishop g7, my opponent would have the option of playing e5. And after I play d takes e5, queen takes e5, my pawn structure is a little more weak. I can't do anything constructive with the relationship between his queen on e5 and my bishop on g7 because my bishop isn't defended and my knight can only go to h5 to protect it. Now my pawn structure is weakened. I can't castle because my e7 pawn will hang. My position is bad. So my opponent playing queen e2 has a threat. He wants to play e5. My natural developmental move doesn't work. What would you do? I played knight d7, retreating my knight away from where the attack was about to come and preparing to develop with bishop g7. Notice now, of course, that e5 would be pointless because I would simply take with my knight. My opponent played a4. 
if I were to respond with a5, I would be allowing white to develop very quickly with the move bishop e3. Do you see why I can't take on b2? After queen b2, he would have the powerful move bishop d4. After I block with e5, my rook was attacked. He plays rook f to b1, and my queen on b2 is trapped. So, for me to try to maintain my queen's position on b6 would be in incorrect because I can't do it. After a4, I just played bishop g7, a5, and my queen retreated back to c7. Now this leads to an interesting discussion. I was trying to decide where to put my queen back to. I should note that moves like queen b4 or queen c5, which might be primitively seen as aggressive, would be silly to pursue because if to queen b4, my queen is on a forward square but not an aggressive square, and after a move like rook a4, she'll have to run back immediately. Queen c5 allows white to continue the development with bishop e3. My queen has to keep on running. So the question is pretty much whether to come back to the c7 square or the d8 square. The b7 square is pointless because it blocks in my c8 bishop and will be exposed to the move a6 at whenever white wants. And the b8 square isn't very good because white will activate the rook sooner or later with the maneuver rook a3 to b3 and will be attacking my queen. So queen c7 is the most logical move, but I was looking at the variation. f4, castles for black, f5. A dynamic move which begins an attack with opening up the f file, keying in on my f7 square, but has the downside of giving me the e5 square. So I looked at the variation knight e5, bishop b3, and in this position, I couldn't see how to improve my game. It's a strange reality. My knight is occupying a wonderful central square, and yet it has nowhere to go. It's hard for black to discover what to do, and white has a clean plan for, to build up their attack. Bishop g5 may come, f6 will come. My king side is going to come under an attack, and it's very hard for me to find a plan. So for a while I was looking at this position. I couldn't figure out what to do. But then I realized something. In my mind, I had automatically made the connection f5, knight e5, bishop b3. When my opponent played f5 in my mind, in my calculations, there was a very clear weakness. There was some space he was leaving behind, which was the e5 square. So for some reason in my thought process, I immediately filled that space with knight e5. What I realized then was that there was no reason to do this. My knight would come to e5 eventually, and my correct move was not knight e5, but rook b8. And now my position is very good. A slightly different response to his attack gives me a lot of play. The point is that now my rook on b8 pins down his bishop on c1. It can't really move because the b2 pawn is hanging. And I have ways to play moves like rook b4, which would pester his bishop on c4. The bishop's logical retreat will be to come back to the b3 square, and then I might not come to e5 at all, but slip into c5, which would pester the bishop on b3, and hone in on his pawn on e4. Notice also that my bishop on g7 is attacking his knight on c3, which defends the e-pawn. So I had to overcome a mechanical response in my mind, which was to immediately fill the space that my opponent left behind, instead of after f5 playing one move that was a little bit slow. And in chess, I often say that the threat is stronger than the execution. In this position, if we look at it, after my opponent plays f4 to f5, he's weakened the e5 square. If I immediately fill the e5 square, yes, my knight is on a very good square. It's a pretty square. But after he responds with bishop b3, we'll notice that the knight on e5, while it's on a good square, one might think, has nowhere that it can go, and it completely blocks in my bishop on g7. So if I immediately occupy the good square, I have no play. While if I leave it to be occupied later, I maintain a dynamic in my game. So in fact, when I played queen c7, I had come to this, while it might be, seem like a completely natural move, I had to go through this thought process to realize not to occupy the e5 square right away. So a5, queen c7, my opponent played f4, and I castled. And now we reached a maneuvering part of the game. f5, on my opponent's part, would be a mistake, as we've seen, because after rook b8, I have the e5 square to, lose, to use later, and he has, it's difficult for him to develop his play. He played the move queen f2. Part of the idea of this move is to play queen h4 at one point to try to activate on the king side. Notice that my e7 pawn will be hanging then. Part of it is to hone in on the f file because after the move f5, f takes g6, he'll have more pieces on the f7 square. Later on, he may want to play bishop e3. It's a move that slightly improves his position. I played rook b8. We've seen this move before. The point 
being partially that the B2 pawn is attacked so the C1 bishop is locked down to the square. A lot of chess development in the opening and early middle game involves developing your pieces to their best squares while trying to hinder your opponent's development. So by playing rook b8, I make it a little more difficult for him to improve his position while improving my position. My opponent played rook a3. So we now begin to feel what his plan is. For one thing, he wants to simply activate his rook, but we see that move queen f2 had a little something to do with the move queen h4, and the move rook a3 eventually might slip all the way over to the h3 square. So we see that he may be thinking about, at one point, a big kingside attack. This is on his mind. Also, rook a3 has, is a prophylactic move. So he's, the, he's, impre he's increasing his position, but he also has the idea of he notices that my next move will very likely be rook b4, attacking his bishop on c4. Now, if his rook were on a1, he would have to respond to that move with either bishop b3 or bishop a2 if he wants to keep the bishop on the strong diagonal. After bishop b3, I could attack it with knight c5, which would be very good for me. And after bishop a2, his rook's activity is completely obstructed. By playing rook a3, he prepared for my move rook b4. And once I play rook b4, he can retreat to a2. His rook is on my part of the board. So this is a typical example of, of the play. But when I played rook b8, I was stopping his bishop on c1 from developing and, and planning to play rook b4. He played rook a3, developing one of his pieces so that he would be able to maintain activity after I continued with my plan. And now I, you should notice that I have a very active-looking move, bishop d4, trying to take advantage of a pin on the queen. But my bishop, my dark square bishop is a great piece, and after he would respond blocking with bishop e3, you might have seen the variation quickly. Bishop takes e3, queen takes e3, rook takes b2. I win a pawn. But in fact, this would be a huge mistake. A lot of the time when you put your piece all the way on the inside of their game, you can get locked in, and there may, be no, and there may not be any way out. What do you think White's best move would be now? He would have bishop b3. And suddenly my active rook is too active for its own good. It can't get out. His next move will be queen c1. The rook on b2 is going to get lost. So while it might have been tempting to play bishop d4, take, take, rook takes b2, I'm up a pawn, it would be a huge mistake. I get locked in and would be in trouble. I played the move knight f6. Notice now that a few moves ago my opponent had a clear spatial advantage, but now my pieces are starting to flow. My rook on b4 is coning on the e4 square and locking his bishop to c1, my bishop on g7 has the potential to come into the d4 square. It's not there now, but later on it might come there. Knight g4 is a threat. Knight g4 will be attacking the queen, bishop d4 coming later. Knight takes e4 is a threat. My opponent has a lot to worry about. He played queen e1, a very good move. His sense of danger kicked in, and my opponent realized that, first of all, his queen and king being lined up on the dark, on the dark a7 to g1 diagonal is a mistake. My bishop on d4 is going to give him problems. Second of all, he's defending his e4 pawn, and he's making knight g4 harmless because it wouldn't be attacking any queen. Queen e1 is a very good defensive move. Now, when a strong player is playing a game, it's very rare that they make a purely defensive move. Usually, in a complex middle game, they'll involve attack with defense. They merge into one. Queen e1 was a move that responded to all my threats and began a little threat of his own. Notice that suddenly his queen and e1 is lined up with my rook on b4. He might be considering a move later, like knight d5, a discovery on the rook on b4. Also, knight d5 would be attacking my queen. It might get complicated. While knight d5 might not be such a strong threat immediately, because, for instance, I have knight takes d5, responding to the threat of my queen and defending my rook on b4, the threat is in the air, and if a slight tactic changes, it can happen. I slightly improve my position of my queen, queen b8, defending my rook on b4 and getting out of the range of his knight. Don't be fooled by a move that goes backwards. My queen is retreating a little bit to b8, but it's a much more active square here. And now my opponent played f5. Notice what he did. For one thing, he waited to play f5 until my knight was off the d7 square. So now the squares e5 and c5 can't be occupied so quickly. He's begun a kingside attack. He wants to open up the f-file, use the bishop on a2, at some point swing his a3 rook into the f3 square or h3 square. The queen may come to h4. He wants to attack. How would you respond? In fact, my whole plan of development has been based around the fact that f5 was virtually his only active plan. My opponent at some point would have to play f5 and I had a way of dealing with it. 
You might want to take a moment and look at White's position before f5 and try to find an active plan. It'll be very difficult. f5 is almost necessary. Think about how you would respond. Don't necessarily try to go straight forward. Take the space that your opponent left behind. What I had planned and what I played was g takes f5, e takes f5, d5. How does that look to you? Do you remember how powerful his bishop on a2 looked a moment ago? How his knight on c3 had good range? My pawns on c6 and d5 now completely lock in his bishop on a2. His knight on c3 has no active move, which means his rook on a3 is all blocked up. By playing gf5, ef5, d5, what I've done is I've slightly opened my king's position, which is a little bit dangerous, but I took the space, took control of the d5 score, which he left behind, and locked all of his pieces into the queen side. Notice that queen takes e7 would be a mistake. Why? What did I have planned? Rook e8, the queen has to go back to c5, and now I would play the move knight g4 with two threats, and he can't respond to them both. The first and most obvious one is queen takes h2 checkmate. When he blocks that by a move like g3, bishop d4 check will win the queen. There's no way out. My pawn on e7 was defended indirectly. My opponent, seeing that his queenside pieces had become a little bit locked in, decided to trade off my active rook on b4 with rook b3. A good move. I played rook takes b3, bishop takes b3, queen b4. This was a strange moment. The last series of moves that I made are the kinds of moves you don't want to make in a chess game. My opponent, by playing rook b3, seems to be planning rook takes b4, and I'll play queen takes b4. So it would be completely logical for me to improve my position a little bit, so that once he takes on b4, queen takes b4, I've gained a tempo in my improvement. The problem is I couldn't figure out how to do that, and my opponent has a threat, bishop f4. His next move, in fact, isn't going to be simply to trade off, but to play bishop f4, attacking my queen, my rook can't take on f4 because rook takes queen on b8. And I would have to play queen b7 and then he would gain time. So while my natural inclination might have been to try to improve my position here by one little move and then to take back on b4, it's impossible. I played rook takes b3, bishop takes b3, queen b4. So notice the main pluses in my position have been exactly what white has given me. He played the queen side thrust a2 to a4 to a5. Now my queen is well placed on b4, the space it left behind. He played the kingside thrust, f4 to f5. I took took and played d5, locking in his b3 bishop, his knight on c3, and taking good central control. All of the pluses in black's position have been based purely upon taking the space my opponent left behind. He played king h1, getting off the a7 g1 diagonal. He was nervous about the fact that at any point I could throw a queen to d4, a queen to c5, or maybe if I move a knight, a bishop to d4, attacking his king. He got off. A good defensive move. Take a moment and try to figure out how black should continue to play the game. My king is a little bit open. The strong point of his pawn on f5 is that it locks in my bishop on c8 and sort of creates a barrier that keeps my queen side away from my king side. So now what he wants to do is try to create a king side attack based upon the fact that it's hard for me to get through. I have strong central control, but my d5 pawn is only defended by my c6 point. My e7 pawn is defended by my queen on b4. I played the move e6, a move with many strong suits. For one thing, it simply gets rid of a weakness, the e7 pawn. Another thing, it gets rid of a strength in his position, the f5 pawn. A move like e6 is a little bit dangerous because it weakens some squares. My f6 knight is now defended only by the bishop, and it looks like he might have a way of undermining it. But I saw that, in fact, he didn't, and this is a very concrete moment in the chess game. Playing the move e6, I'm getting rid of my weakness on e7, and now the weakness of his a5 pawn is outlined. By playing the move e6, what I've done is I've made white prove his position. This is a psychological idea which I like to, to use in my games. The point is that white has to prove an initiative right away, or else he'll, be a, he'll have a worse game. If he plays f takes e6, f takes e6, black will have a strong center, my rook on f8 will become active, everything is good in my game. If he doesn't do that, I'm going to play e takes f5 next move. White has to do something. By playing e6, I've immediately challenged the strongest point in his position, f5. If he, do, if he responds by exchanging pawns, I'll have a better game. What he's forced to do is try to find a specific response to my plan, and there is none. He's going to have to concede some ground. My opponent played bishop d2. Queen d6. 
he was threatening Knight takes d5 with a discovery. And now, he couldn't figure anything else out and played f takes e6. If he had continued to attack my queen with a move like bishop f4, my move was going to be simply queen d8, getting out of the attack, and now the a5 pawn is under attack once more. If he would have played bishop g5, trying to pin me, I could either take on a5, but the, but the best move would simply be to play a, e takes f5. That pawn may look weak, but my bishop on c8 defends it very well. Everything is perfectly fine in my game. I'm up a pawn. I'm going to take on a5, and imagine my queen not being on the d8 square, and suddenly knight e4 crashing in. A very solid square. His game has fallen apart. My opponent played f takes e6, f takes e6. Whose position do you like more? I'm sure you'd say blacks. I have a better center. My bishop on g7 looks very active. My rook on f8 is a good piece, counteracting his rook. His bishop on b3 and knight on c3 are completely out of the game. The pawn on a5 is a slight weakness. One piece with mine which is not very active is my bishop on c8. I understand that. Things aren't perfect. It'll come out later. What you should notice is that the strongest part of Black's game is the center. Think back to how I gained control of that center. It was his attacking move, f5, that allowed me to take control of the middle of the board. I didn't take the center straight away, but took it once he gave it to me. His only way of continuing with the initiative was to try to attack on the king's side, and by doing that, I simply took the space. In chess thought, it's very common for people to think, what can I do? A deeper way of thinking is what must my opponent do and what will I do to respond. He played bishop f4. After bishop f4, I came back to the b4 square. And now my opponent played bishop d2. He's trying to draw the game. He sees that he has no active plan. His bishop on b3 and knight on c3 are very weak. My, his a5 pawn is weak. He wants to try to go back and forth. He's hoping I'll play queen back to d6 and continue the repetition. He'd like to draw the game. Here I played the move knight g4. I'm not playing for a draw. This move involved a long calculation, which in fact he challenged. It also involves the judgment that if we trade rooks, it's to my advantage. His king on h1 is pretty weak. After he plays the move rook takes f8, queen takes f8, what's going to happen is that my knight is coming into the f2 square check, my bishop is coming into the d4 square, my black bishop can come to a6 if it wants to, but most importantly, I can play the move e6 to e5 and my center starts marching. You should also notice that after e5, my bishop on c8 suddenly becomes a good piece. I might want to play the move king h8 to get off the diagonal of his bishop on b3 before playing e5. My position is very good. After the exchange of rooks, you should notice that his rook had slightly more, more scope than mine. When my knight was on f6, his rook was honing in on that thing, and my rook was sort of defending it. After knight g4, that trade of rooks would weaken his king more. The rook on f1 is a key defender in his position. But of course, playing knight g4 is a little bit dangerous. He has some tactics. What do you think white should do? His best response was to play rook takes f8, queen takes f8, an exchange which is good for me, and then the move knight d1. Conceding a little space, going backwards. The b2 pawn is defended by his knight on d1, and he's defended the f2 square. Now my position is much better. I would probably play the move king h8, and soon play the moves e5 and e4, take more control of the center, push him back. I have a better game. Not winning, but better. Sometimes when you have a worse position, you have to make a small concession in order not to lose a lot. That was his best response. My opponent chose to go into a forced variation, which I had calculated. He played knight takes d5. Why don't you press pause and think for a moment? What did I have in mind? When I played knight g4, I had seen that his best move was rook takes f8, and that I would have a better game. I had, of course, calculated the move knight takes d5 because I had to. The point is, first of all, that he's, he's exposed to discovered attack on my queen. If I can't take back the knight, because he'll simply take my queen. The next move into the calculation is that his rook, our rooks are exposed to one another. And I have two ways of trying to use that. The first is to try to play queen takes d2, with the idea of if he takes back my queen, rook takes f1 will be made. This wouldn't work because of a simple in-between move. Queen takes d2, he'd play rook takes f8 check first, after I take back, he'd take my queen. I'll have lost a queen. The rook takes f1, which happened in the game. Queen takes f1. I've removed the defender of the d2 bishop. Queen takes d2. My opponent, of course, saw this. He had planned to move knight e7 check. King h8, knight takes c8. So his calculation had reached this position, and he had seen that he wins a pawn. When I played knight g4, I had seen this position, 
and looked a little further. I should note that my opponent cannot try to mate me with queen f7, threatening queen g8, because I have a simple back rank mate, queen e1 checkmate. Or queen e1, he has to go back to f1, and then queen takes f1 checkmate. So my opponent's calculation ended around the move knight takes c8. After knight takes c8, what would you do? In chess, there's the combination of the specific and the abstract. Abstractly, we can feel. I have traded off two active pieces of his, the bishop on d2 and the rook on f1, and he's taken off my rook on f8, which was defending my knight on f6, and my least active piece, the bishop on c8. So abstractly, we can see that maybe there should be something here. Specifically, what is it? Knight f2 check, king g1, bishop d4. Suddenly, white's game is on the brink of total disaster. This quiet move at the end, bishop d4, challenges white's entire game. The first point is that I'm threatening a lot of different discovered checks, and he can't avoid that. Knight g4 will be check, knight h3 will be check, knight e4 will be check, knight d3 will be check, knight d1 will be check. Anywhere my knight moves, my bishop on d4 will be exposed to his king. The next thing is that I can make some moves to keep that checking option alive. White can't move the king, so the point is that no matter what he does, I'm going to have a discovered check. And the point is that I have mates in the air everywhere. After bishop d4, my position is winning by force. Try to take a moment and see if you can find any moves for white, and look at the response that I had planned. If his queen moves off the back rank, I'll simply play queen e1 check. The queen will have to go back to f1, then after my knight moves, his king has to go to the corner, and queen takes f1 will be mate. My opponent played c3 attacking my bishop. Right now is a funny little moment. When you're on the very edge of winning, your emotional response may be to lunge forward, to be impatient, to be a little bit emotional. My bishop is attacked, but since I have so many active moves, we may want to play things like knight h3 check or just any check, but it's not necessary. Knight h3 check, king h1. I don't have a good next move. I'd have to come back with knight f2 check. The piece which is going to deliver the discovered check is threatened. I simply retreated, bishop c5. This move maintains all of the attacking options. White has nothing else to do. He played the move h3. What would you do now? Again, your first impulse, I'm sure, was to immediately play a discovered check. Maybe knight takes h3 check. Maybe knight d3 check. Maybe something, anything, to, to check him to play a fancy move. It's not necessary. He has only one way to get out of the discovered check. Maintain the tension. The threat is often much stronger than the execution. I played the move queen f4, slightly improving my attacking pieces. The point is that if I play knight takes h3 check, once his king moves, for instance, to h2, it's not really clear how I'm going to continue the attack. I've played a good check, yeah, what now? When I play queen f4, I keep all the attacking options in the air. I could still take on h3 if I want to. Notice now, of course, after knight takes h3, when his king moves to h1, he'll lose the queen on f1. But I have a bigger threat. My real threat is knight g4 check. And after his king goes to h1, queen h2 will be mate. Now there's nothing white can do. In fact, when his pawn was still on h2, I had two threats. One was the simple move queen f4. And one was the interesting little tactic, knight e4 check, king h1. Do you see mate in two? Knight g3 check. A sacrifice. After h takes g3, queen h6 is mate. My bishop guards the g1 square, and he's mated on the h-file. Playing defensively in this kind of position, it's almost impossible to see all the different attacking options black will have. My opponent responded to that first idea, knight e4, knight g3, queen h6, mate, by playing h3. Now after knight e4 check, he would come up to h2, and I would have no use of the g3 square. So I used my second idea, queen f4. Now it has some big problems. Knight g4 check is threatened. He played the move queen c4, a move which seems like a logical way of trying to fight. He's attacking my queen on f4 and attacking the piece on c5. So if I move my knight anywhere, he's going to take, try to take on c5. He wants to trade down queens. I wasn't really worried about that. What do you think I played? After my next move, he resigned. A little piece sacrifice to cap things off. Knight g4 check. 
Notice that in this moment, in the final position where my opponent resigned, all of my attacking pieces are being attacked. My queen on f4 is hanging, my bishop on c5 is hanging, and my knight on g4 is hanging. But he's in check. If he goes to h1, I play queen h2 mate. If he takes my checking piece, queen takes c5, I use a mate which we haven't looked at, queen c1 check. My knight on g4 guards the f2 and h2 squares. After he blocks with bishop d1, I would play queen takes d1, and that would be mate. So my opponent resigned in the final position, where all my attacking pieces are hanging. It's kind of a nice way to cap things off. So when you see this game, it's very easy to focus on the attack at the end, on the kind of brutal, fancy harmony of the pieces attacking the white king. You might think of this as a purely attacking game. But what you should focus on is not so much the brutality of the attack, but the way that it came about. I did not force things to happen. I let them happen. The way that I won in this game, the way I attacked my opponent, was by taking the space that he gave to me. And every single move that your opponent makes leaves a little something behind. If you're keen to that, if you're keen to that reality in chess, you'll find flaws in almost every move they make. So now that you've seen the culmination of this game, why don't you go back and look over the quiet moves, the little moves I played when I retreated my queen from c7 to b8, how I responded to f5 by taking it and playing d5. Look at every little quiet move I made and feel its place, its part, in the final assault. Don't be afraid to make a quiet move in chess. Aggression does not mean straight ahead. Sometimes you have to go back to go forward. Yield and overcome.